Hey everybody, welcome to part two of the q and I didn't actually think we would have a part two, but there we go. You asked a lot of questions that there was no way that I was going to be able to answer, so I got the man with the answers to answer them for us. But before we get to that, just a few things. You will have noticed that the uh, orientation of this video is slightly different. I'm not as close to the camera because quite a few of you, including Salty Pies on YouTube, said something about this video makes me feel like Alex is standing over me as I was lying down. Not the effect that I was going for. Very creepy. So I'm tinkering, new to this. Usually we're out in the field doing this type of thing. So uh, yeah, fix that. Greg said it made it look like I was a little bit too much up in your grill. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Just a couple more things before we get into the meat of this and Greg answers those questions that you also generously submitted that I just can't answer. Uh, the first is, and most importantly, is that I hope you're all happy and healthy in these truly bizarre times. It's uh, been very weird, but also very encouraging to hear how many of you are, are dealing with this and how you're dealing with it and how you're excited about travel. I am too. I can't wait to go back out and start filming again. We have already started the planning our next few episodes. I'm not going to tell you where they are, but they are very much off the beaten path. I think that's what you want. It's certainly what I want. Uh, just a reminder that you can still subscribe to be a Patreon supporter. It helps us immeasurably. Uh, those of you that already are will see this episode way before anybody else. That's one of the perks. So check out our Patreon page if you can. Participate in any way you can. I'd really appreciate it. But I also know this is a time in everybody's life where money is not as readily available as perhaps it was. So I totally understand uh, if you'd rather just not for the time being. I get it. I really do get it. Uh, the next one is because of that, uh, the attache ebook or the digital version of the book that we released a couple of years ago, it's usually on, on uh, sale for 11 pounds. Uh, I made it available for a pound about a buck 30 us go nuts enjoy it tell me what you think if you want us to do more volumes let me know i've kind of been putting off that decision for a while now another thing that we've been doing uh that has was born out of some requests that that you guys had was on instagram uh and then on facebook through kind of syndication as often as i can almost every day i'm looking back into the photo archives from all of our travels and i'm posting pictures and telling stories from behind the scenes um, from all over the world. And it's been really fun for me, and I hope you guys are enjoying them. You seem to be enjoying them. So if you don't, follow us on Instagram or on Facebook. Check them out. I'm trying to post them every single day, uh, and I'll, I'll continue to do that until we run out of things to talk about. Um, and then we finally, we're going to be doing a follow-up to this Q&A, believe it or not, because so many of you had additional questions to the content that we've posted already. But I have a question for you. Would you rather it was a video like this pre-recorded or would you like a live Q&A? Let me know in the comments below which you'd prefer and we'll get cracking with that. And without further ado, let's go to the man with all of the answers, Sir Greg Barnez. I feel like we would probably have done this in the same room had the world stopped, not stopped turning. Yeah, we would have shared a sofa like last time, but um, yeah. just couldn't allow. So I'm doing this Q&A and I have some questions that are very much above my pay grade. Um, so I'm hoping that you can help. So the first one is one that a lot of people have asked, including Zan Marcan uh, on YouTube. What camera and equipment do you use to film and edit? I very obviously cannot answer that question. Yeah, well, you probably could. I've, we forced you into it. I reckon you could take a good stab at it. I presume so is listening. So when we film, the cameras have largely remained the same with some variation throughout the series. We started off, um, as you would have seen in the last video, we talked about kit with the Panasonic GH4, I believe. And then we went into the C100 Mark II by Canon, which is a much more uh, intensive, larger camera, um, which was not actually as convenient for travel purposes. So we went back to the GH5, the later model of the GH4, which is amazingly competent. It has uh, internal stabilization, 4K video, incredible slow motion, XLR inputs for microphones. It's the all rounder. And I would still use that on most shoots today. It's just so great to be able to put in your pocket and take anywhere you want to. 
Although there is also the hunger to kind of upgrade and make our imagery more and more cinematic as we go. So the latest addition to the family is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K GB, A, B, C, D, E, F, C. <laughs> there is so many uh, letters in that name, it's ridiculous. But it's a great camera. It's a pocket cinema camera and it really is that. Probably less of an all-rounder and less intuitive. If you're backed into a corner, it doesn't do everything easily like the GH5 does. It doesn't have stabilization. But if you nurse it just that little bit more, you'll get incredible imagery out of it. It's kind of breathed new life for me into the process. Just only recently. I think we've only been using it since Vienna. Yeah, that's, yeah I remember you were very excited that uh, you had this new camera for, for Vienna. And it, what I was always fascinated by was you would choose the rig based on the destination to an extent where if we had to be slightly more surreptitious, you would have a a setup for situations like that where we didn't really want to draw attention to ourselves. Often is the case that the destination certainly dictates the camera. I would much rather go for the smaller profile uh, camera and not draw as much attention to ourselves. You could say bring the bigger camera look more legitimate, but that's only proved to draw more attention to us in the yeah. past. Oh my God. So true. <laughs> yeah. So true. And it's, it's not, I don't know if, it, if it's about safety or just, just not getting harassed by a kind of jobs worth quasi officials, which seems to have been universally the problem that we've run into in those yeah. frustrating situations. Yeah, yeah. And I'm increasingly more and more impatient. So I worry about putting myself into those situations. It's happened a few times where we've been approached or by people that are clearly uh, not authorized to even question why we're there and we're not breaking any law or anything like that. And that that's frustrating because we went and found that shot on purpose and they've ruined it. They've ruined it. <laughs> yeah, which is true. And it's the complete reverse of um, the nicer side of things where, like in India, I don't think we could take like five steps without somebody coming up and saying, like, oh, wow, you're shooting on this camera. I love it. Like, what do you think of it? It does bring out a nice social side of people as well. Um, God, I miss yeah. people. Yeah, you've definitely had a lot of uh, fellow camera dorks coming up to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, it's true though. It's nice. And it's, we've met some really interesting people along the way. Yeah. Uh, I do. Rem I was thinking about this before we started talking that, uh, I can't remember how many episodes it was, but the f first several, you had a separate sound rig that you had to sort of keep at your feet with the wireless mic that I was wearing. And uh, it looked like a lot of work for you. And then having to sync everything in, uh, in post as well. Yeah, that was the beginning days when, and it was the norm, you would have a separate module, which would be either like a Tascam or a Zoom recorder, and your microphone would have gone directly into that. And I would have carried it around in any way I could. It didn't even fit on my rig very nicely. So sometimes I think I had it on a strap or on my shoulder, and it felt like being a Ghostbuster, but in the most uncool, <laughs> laborious way. And then afterwards, yeah. exactly that, you'd come back and you'd have like 150 sound files that you had to match up with your 150 video files. And when you're on the run, <laughs> on the run, that sounds really silly. <laughs> yeah. When you're running When you've gun... been filming illegally. <laughs> when we've kidnapped somebody. Um, when we're um, run and gun filming in these locations, you don't always have the luxury of being able to be as organized. So it often feel like coming back to the edit afterwards and being like, oh my God, there's so much detective work I have to do now. Where was I when I recorded that audio file? And uh, yeah, we've come leaps and bounds and uh, I can't even imagine doing that now. It's weird how you get so used to the luxuries that we have now that I can't imagine going back and doing that much organizational work afterwards in the edit. It does seem a little archaic, but speaking of edit, what's the process there? Because you, you have this, uh propensity habit almost of as soon as we finish the day's worth of shooting you disappear and you take the cards and back them up what happens when you get back i'm having a bath alex it's uh oh, it's that's a big ruse. that noise is okay right <laughs> no but i will go back because um you know there have been scares in the past where you're like where is this file and it really pays you to go back look through the files make sure you've got everything that you needed and also back it up there's no bigger fear than losing something that you've really worked hard for. And that's also a day when we're traveling, 
we're not going to get that day again. Uh, and there's also been times where it's really served us well because I've gone through a shot and been like, you know that piece to camera you did? It didn't really work in that location. Or it was like much louder atmospherically than we thought. So it makes a lot of sense just to make sure you have everything the night of having shot it. And that took me a while to learn as well. Like it's all um, trial through error. What the hell was that? Well, it seems to work and because you always come up. Well, I mean, the episodes are what they are because of, of you and the, the editing process. Do you, you use? I don't even remember what software you use. What software do you use? I use Adobe Premiere Pro and I love it because uh, it's a subscription based model. So it's available at some price level to even people starting out. You pay about £45 a month. And I know that sounds like a lot, but other platforms are trying to make you pay, I don't know, a grand or something up front, which a lot of people just don't have. You can't learn of that. And also it's just become second nature to me now. If you stick with a platform, it really is um, a great moment when you can think about an edit you want to make and you can do it through muscle memory and you don't have to worry. There is no lack of translation between the thought and the action. And that's really when you can start having fun with, with the edit and trying out new things or going crazy with something. Um, it would take a lot for me to move across to another platform now, although DaVinci Resolve is doing some interesting things. But um, I don't see myself going back to Final Cut anytime soon. And then we, or we, you use, you put the drafts up on Vimeo, which then has got this neat feature where I can just click and then type a note and it's time stamped and, and, and everything. But actually, I mean, it's probably worth saying at this point, we've done what, 45 episodes. I think the last like three, maybe even more than that, maybe even like 10, there have been no edits. I, I I think that we've we've found this rhythm and, you know, not templates because it makes it sound like we just keep doing the same thing over and over again, but just an understanding of what we're trying to achieve that, you know, we 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 don't have to go back and forth a million times on, on, on. And I guess, you know, it's worth saying that what what we generally do is um, I write a script with PTCs and maybe, I don't know, 25 percent of the VO just so that it's not me constantly on camera and we go and film that in a bunch of b-roll and then when we come, when we come back you you put a kind of uh i don't know what you were like a straw man together and go okay well we're gonna need vo here 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 and here and put that draft on vimeo where i can look and see where what the b-roll looks like that i'll need to t be talking over send greg the individual files the audio files for each uh piece of vo and then you stitch it together using your wizardry yeah um, it's a model that really works for us because i think it, the the thing that really helps is that if we have a script that you've written before we go somewhere so we have an idea of where we think we're going to take it and then that inevitably evolves as we're there as things happen yeah. and then i at least have the toolkit then with some initial vo to get going with the edit and we can see what this episode looks like and then you come in and your next round of vo is the polishing touches the bits that kind of bring together two scenes that otherwise might jar or yeah. might need a, just a little bit of extra explanation yeah and I, I don't ever write the intro or outro and i shouldn't say never but rarely write the intro and outro until we've been and i can see how i feel about a place and and that also, I think in a way kind of dictates the tone of the episode as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, I think after 45 or what, I think it is at least 45 episodes, we've, we've yeah. found our rhythm in our process and we, you know, I, I tell people all the time when I talk about the show uh, and, and the process that leading up to a, to a filming or even during a filming, you can, you'll say to me, okay, what, what are we doing here? What kind of episode is this? And I can say it's in LA. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Or it's a Beirut or it's a, you know, and you'll know exactly what that means. And we, we, we don't need to say any more than that because it's it's kind of, as you say, almost muscle memory for the types of episodes that we create. It's true. Um, and I think we could probably break it down to three main formats. But <clears throat> like you say, like using country or, or city names like LA, that's like a variation of a certain format. And it does become mm -hmm. a language. And I think that's why we haven't had edits or notes with each other since producing the last few episodes 
it's because that language has been really developed and it's a nice thing when you both know exactly what the goal is because yeah. uh, it means you're both aiming towards exactly the same pinpoint at that bit. It's just really refreshing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And one would hope after that many episodes, we would have, because if we were still fumbling around with the same thing, I think, it, it, you know, yeah, it would, yeah, it would not be a good sign. Uh, so Zan and many, many other people, thank you very much for that question. The next one, uh, <laughs> I rather like two-parter. Three-parter, geez, greedy. Uh, what has been the most challenging shoot and why? Parts one and two. Also, how does Greg get his hair to do that thing? <laughs> it's a side-parter. It's not a one or two-parter. It's a side-parter. Will Hunter, I don't know if you know him. But, uh... <laughs> Who's that guy? Yeah. <laughs> so it's the most challenging shoot. What do you reckon? Oh, challenging. That's an interesting one. Um, maybe I remember Mumbai was difficult just for the fact it was so hot that whenever mm. we went from interiors to exteriors, we had to wait a while for my lenses to, to unfog. Um, oh, that's right. I forgot. That really slowed us down uh, <laughs> sometimes. Um, no matter how much you're wiping a lens, it's like just instant fog again. Um, and I think when it's the weather conditions are that hectic, it can get overwhelming. New York, um, Manhattan episode, it just didn't stop raining the entire time, like heavy torrential rain. Of course, until the last afternoon when we were leaving. Um, but yeah, I, I think the most challenging times for me have been weather-based because it's all about yeah. keeping your camera in the right condition. But I'm trying to think, like, have you had any tough ones when it comes to the actual environment, the people? or the... I think, yeah, I, I think... Um... I think St. Petersburg was a challenge because I hadn't done a good job of expressing to the people that were helping us on the ground of what, how we work and what we were trying to achieve. So we lost a lot of time uh, in translation there that uh, we, sh we should have, you know, in, in, in situations that we couldn't extract ourselves from for hours. And we have to be really, really uh, efficient with our time. Otherwise, we just we lose we lose a shoot. So that was that was my fault. I think. Um, Delhi was Delhi was frustrating in some regards and wonderful in others. I think we ran into a lot of people who um, wanted to know what we were doing and why we were filming a lot of officials, but but not not really. I think there are some episodes which take a lot of pre-production, but that's absolutely worth it. A lot of the Japanese episodes um, do, but they ap they absolutely yield, you know, the the, the quality that we want. We we get out what we've put in times a hundred. But other than that, no, I, I don't think there have been places where we've been. Well, actually that's, a, that, that brings us on to the next question. This is from Anwen Botois on Twitter. Anwen, I really hope I pronounced your name properly. Again, a two parter. Uh, where did you visit that you were expecting to love, but didn't? And where did you visit that you didn't expect to like, but loved? Hmm. Good. That's a good one. one. Yeah. Um, that is a tough one. I think um, on the topic of, and it might have been because of the Whistle Stop tour we had of it, and I wanted to see so much more of the place, St. Petersburg was probably the one that I was most excited about and then came away with feeling like it wasn't what I wanted it to be. It's a beautiful city, but I just didn't see the parts that I was intrigued by on that trip. Um, I think the place that I was mo more, most surprised by, Beirut, I think. Yeah. Like Beirut was stunning and the food was incredible everywhere we went and the people inviting and I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't that. Yeah, I think for me, the one I didn't really know about or didn't know what to expect but loved was Mexico City. Um I just completely fell in love with that place to the point where I went back again and again and again. And I, I just, I love so it. Jealous. Um, I, I, I just am completely captivated by that place and can't wait to go back. I think in terms of loving or just not feeling, you don't want to talk trash about a place, obviously, but the place that uh, I came away with very mixed feelings about, even though I'd been there before, was Seattle. Uh, mm, yeah. I think we... We went at a time where they were experiencing a lot of uh, uh, socioeconomic and, and, and just social problems. And it was manifesting itself in a, you know, a really huge divide that everybody could experience, especially through the lens of an outsider. And that was kind of a frustrating 
uh, shoot as well. It just nothing, nothing. I don't know if we were having bad luck. Nothing seemed to work the way we hoped it would. Um, yeah, you're right. I remember was... coming away from Seattle feeling um, frustrated and having been there previously, like maybe five or six years ago, I loved it. And it, I'm not sure if it's like, it, it felt like a temporary thing or maybe an of the moment problem, but it definitely was a contrast from the last time that I was there. Um, yeah, odd one. Yeah, it, it was an odd one. That's a great question though. Uh, I, I, I loved Mexico City. I think it, well, again, it brings us, I'm not doing this on purpose. This is just the way the conversation is going, but uh, oh, our other brother, a Andrew Hunter, at Andrew underscore Hunter 05 on Instagram. Which do you think is the best episode you've produced? Which one are you most proud of? For me, it's um, a toss up between Los Angeles and one of the Japanese ones, perhaps um, Fuji or Kyushu. Mm -hmm. I think those are the ones we had the most fun with where we had like really interesting extra segments that happened quite spontaneously. And I think my waistline would tell you that I had the most fun in both those countries too. <laughs> <laughs> they were, yeah, they were all the Japanese ones. I mean, it's, it's, it's so easy to create compelling content in Japan from a, what's available to you, not necessarily in actually capturing it and then turning it into something um, interesting. But I think every episode we've done in Japan has been a lot of fun. Um, for me, my the episode I'm proudest of is probably Mexico City. It's a great one. That just came together. The, you know, we we were so lucky that we had a team, a production team on the ground there. Thanks to you, actually, um, with Kath that he, you had worked on on a music video shoot in the past, um, uh, Danny and Enrique that that just took us to places we never ever would have gone um, at all ever in a million years. And it, it just, that, that's such a great city. It's so atmospheric. Obviously the food is incredible, but they just, they just took us places where we, even if we'd found them, which we wouldn't have, we would have maybe looked in and gone, we won't be welcome here, but we were made to feel like honored guests because of, of those guys. And I think it just, it, it just worked. And we, it was harder on the ground. It was really, really hard work. Uh, it was harder to put together because it was this slightly hybrid model episode. But it was I'm I'm incredibly proud of that episode. Yeah, you're right. One. And actually, I, I look back on Mexico City as similarly like one of my favorite experiences is the fact it felt like there was a surprise around every corner. And yeah. uh, like most memorably for me, I think and possibly you was going to that dance hall where they're all just dancing this amazing, um, I guess it's salsa. Is it salsa? I don't know what it was. It was great though. It was incredible. <laughs> like ballroom dancing, like old, yeah. old people. What old people do? They're yeah, and I'm there like eyes. thinking, holy shit, this, this is a camera opportunity. Like this is so visually exciting. And I, I think it's exactly, uh, we owe that to the fixes because we would yeah. never have gotten in there without them. And there was some, it just, it's wonderful to see real people enjoying a culture that is so alien to anything yeah. that I've experienced and just getting a glimpse. That was great. We, we spent maybe half an hour in there and it yielded a 90 second, you know, no, no PTC, no VO, just standalone bit in the middle of the episode that made the episode. And you know, that just, it, I think it gave us, uh, you know, we looked at, at that and thought, gosh, that that if we if only every shoot could have that wealth of as yeah. you say surprising content, yeah. Um, at, at Beirut forced us to do that because you can't you can't do a normal. It was the first time where we'd come into a city where the normal format of transport, food, money just wouldn't have worked, and that that got that going at first. But we never. I don't think we perfected it until Mexico City and or L.A. As you say, L.A. is a great episode. Yeah, uh, there's so much fun. Like. Just being able to experience so much in such a short space of time, I think often we leave a shoot with the same sort of feeling that I feel when I watch back one of our videos. It's like so fast paced and so intense. And I'm glad that we have like a record of the things that we've seen and done afterwards. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just nonstop. I mean, we, uh, our shoot days are, you know, 12 to 14 hours without exception. And because we have to cover, 
daytime and uh, often at nighttime, and we want to capture as much as we can. So they are they're full on, and as you say, you forget moments that you that you experienced. Very important question from Enderdriser on YouTube: Will Greg host one of your videos? <laughs> uh, we tried to have me do an intro once. <laughs> Singapore, I remember that. Yeah, in Singapore, that was hectic. Um, who knows? Maybe if um, Alex dies in some mysterious accident. Coronavirus death. related. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, that's really bad. <laughs> I was building the idea that I might frame your somebody in a murder case. Not that you... But you don't have to now. We're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> We've got so little time. We're going to do attache Greg's house. Attache <laughs> Alex's house. <laughs> we can do all... The, you know... Everybody's invited to do present their own episode of yeah, their home. That's, that's, that's a good idea. Cribs, attache, lockdown. <laughs> the street um, food in my house is disgusting. Hey, guy. Hey, buddy. What, what, are you doing? what are you doing? Um, I was just giving what you do a shot. All right, final, final question, uh, and probably the most complex, uh, from Ira Cortez uh, on uh, Instagram. Is Greg single? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no and i'm sure my girlfriend is listening downstairs even though i told her to close the door and hide um no and my life is in danger if i say anything else. <laughs> so there you have it i it's it's a little distressing how often i hear that question uh through various uh means but there we go greg street food vendors for doing are always asking do, it. thank you for sparing the time to do this hey this not at fun. all it's been fun it's been great cool